Welcome back to our series in Advanced Aircraft Turbine Modeling. In this episode, we're going to look at the history of the CF-34 and hopefully gather enough data to create our own engine deck in Python. Let's dive right in! Let's have a look at the engine we're trying to model here. The CF-34 family started its days as the TF-34 with 9,000 pound thrust. It powered the S3A and the A-10 in the early 70s. At the time, it incorporated a fan with a bypass ratio on par with the Rolls-Royce Spey around 5 to 1, which was in itself a feature to unlock its fuel efficiency, especially when compared to other engines of the era, which had bypass ratios between 2 and 4. In the same time frame, Bill Lear was developing a business jet with a wide cabin, and its engine of choice was the Garrett TFE-3731, which itself had a bypass ratio of 2.8 to 1. The design was eventually bought by Canadair in 1976, which further developed it into what became the Challenger 600, and because of its larger size, the engines were upgraded to the Lycoming ALF 502L. Shortly after production started, Canadair introduced the Challenger 601, now with engines upgraded to the CF 3401A that GE had been developing since 1980. That engine produced 9,140 pounds of static thrust at sea level, receiving its type certificate in 1982. Then in 86, GE certified the Dash 3 Ace with improved temperature margin for 5-minute takeoff power, but still in the ballpark of 9,000 pounds. It further evolved into the Dash 3A1 in 1991, Dash 3A2 in 1992, and the Dash 3B, Dash 3B1 in 1995, each time improving a little in its temperature margin and equipping the Bombardier CRJ line of regional jets. The mid-90s also saw the regional jets take a bigger market from the turboprops, and GE saw an opportunity to further develop the CF-34, now with a more powerful Dash 8 at 14,000 pounds of thrust. And then the Dash 8C was first used in the CRJ-700 in 1999, while the Dash 8E on the ERJ-170-175 in 2001 and these engines were type certified in 2002. The last variant, the Dash 10, was unveiled in the early 2000s and designed specifically for the ERJ-190-195 aircraft. This engine reached around 20,000 pounds of uh, thrust, but it employed a different design than its siblings. Instead of using the same turbo machinery as the previous models, the Dash 10 uses part of the CM56 core. For instance, Models Dash 1 and Dash 3 and Dash 8 have only one compressor's pool, while the new Dash 10 has a low and a high pressure compressor, each running on its own shaft and dedicated turbine. So the Dash 10 was type certified in 2004. Let's look at GE's site for more info on the CF-34. And down here, we can see a table with a comparison between models. Notice again that the Dash 10 has two compressor's pools versus only one on the other models. So this is the engine we will build our deck for. Now, digging deeper into the engine characteristics, let's look at the cross-section slash gas path. So here we have a good visual idea of the components we need to have in our model. We'll need an inlet, a fan, an airflow splitter, a low-pressure compressor, some cooling bleed, a high-pressure compressor, a combustor, a high-pressure turbine, a low pressure turbine, a fan nozzle, we'll call this the bypass nozzle, a core nozzle, and the two shafts. And as you can see, that's a lot of components we we'll need to have in our models. But before we dive right in, it is important to take note of what we're leaving out. To do this, we can look at the CMM index published by GE. And if we scroll down this document, we can have a pretty good idea of the many components that are required to have a functional engine. Right on the second page, you already have two systems we're not modeling. The lubrication system, notice the oil cooler here, and the anti-ice system, notice the thermal anti-ice valve. 
Let's keep going down. We will notice many non-significant items like this hook latch assembly, but also a few significant items that would add some losses to our model. Of course, we could extend our model to incorporate these smaller components, but then it's a question of how complex we want to go. It's always a trade-off. So let's see, nothing on page six. Page seven has the fan call that we have. On page eight, we also see the fuel filter and pump on the next page, together with the fuel oil heater exchangers. Uh, these will have an impact on our model, and if we wanted to refine it, we would need to account for the mechanical energy we spend with the pump. And we will do that on a more granular level. But also the thermal energy we recover from the hot oil, that's not going to be in our model. Moving on to page 10, we have more fuel systems. 11, we have wiring harnesses. 12 also. 13, we have ignition systems, but also notice the transient bleed valve, which we are leaving out since our model will be steady state only. We are definitely not modeling engine transients. Page 14 has a bunch of systems. The low pressure turbine active clearance control valve, which varies the amount of bleed air from the fourth and the ninth stages that are used to cool the cooling rings that are placed around the turbine in order to control the gap between the turbine blades and the turbine case. You want to control this gap, especially when you are in cruise mode, which will get you a better fuel efficiency. We're not modeling the system and you can see it gets complicated very fast if we want to complete our model. So you have to be aware that our model will be limited and be cognizant of that. On this page 14 still, we have a VSV, the variable stator veins, and the VBV, variable bleed valve. We will somewhat capture the VSV with our compressor map, but we will not model a variable bleed. This is mainly used on engine transients. Moving on, page 15 has a bunch of sensors. Page 16 has some valves, control units. 17 has more valves. 18 has the fan reverser, which we are not gonna have as well. 19 has oil, we talked about that. 20 continues with more oil and sensors and 21 has the starter. Again, not important for us. Okay, with that, we can start looking for the data that we will need to define in PyCycle in order to establish the conditions we want the engine to be sized for. So, what is the strategy here? To be able to define the engine, we would need to know the design point. Typically, the design point for our commercial engines is the cruise phase, where airlines spend most of the time flying and burn the majority of the fuel on a commercial engine like this. The aircraft we're aiming for is the Embraer ERJ-190-195. So let's have a look first at their Wikipedia page. If we look at the bottom, we can see that these aircraft have their crews published at Mach 0.78. That's where the aircraft will be spending most of its time cruising, so it makes total sense to optimize fuel flow for this condition. Not take off, not max thrust. So we'll go with that for our target speed. Now, at which altitude? Well, for that, we would need to look at the performance data and check which altitude or altitude profile gives most range when taking off full fuel and whatever payload is left. This is not the only criteria, but it's one of them. Unfortunately, we do not have this as public information, but I'm going to make an educated guess here that we can cruise at 35,000 feet. But even if we look at AFM published aircraft crew's fuel flow for the conditions that we just defined, we would still not know the thrust that the engine would be producing. This data is definitely not published by the OEMs. One approach would be to estimate the aircraft drag and state that thrust equals drag, but good luck with that. In this case, for example, although the aircraft is not at a very high Mach number, the wing might be close to the transonic regime and you have all the Mach nonlinearities at that point. So what do we do? We need to find thrust data for the engine with fuel flow to allow us to calculate the thermodynamics. Well, we do have one data point. You see, modern engines are regulated under ICAO emissions guidelines. 
and they need to be certified for CO2 and that is verified on a proper test stand and published by the certification authorities. So let's head to EASA's site and have a look at what we, we have available for us for the CF34. If we look under the EASA data sheets, and as always, the link is going to be in the description, we can download the zip file with data for engines that were certified and get the following numbers for the CF34-10 E5A1 model. And oh, let me create a table with the data that we get to make things easier later. Notice we have the ambient conditions at 294.5 Kelvin and pressure at 98.5 kilopascals. This is going to equate to 794 feet elevation and ISA plus 7.5. We then have the bypass ratio that's stated to be 5.1 and the pressure ratio to be 27.3. We have the rated output of 83.7 kilonewtons which equates to 18,817 pounds of thrusts. And they state that the fuel flow here at this uh, full power condition is going to be 0 0.871 kilograms per second or 1.92 pounds per second. Okay, so we have one data point with a big caveat. This is very far from our cruise condition. And like I said, we don't want to optimize our engine for takeoff and we aim for the cruise condition. So we should not use these numbers directly, but we're going to use them indirectly. We're going to choose design values for a bypass ratio and thrust for our design point, i.e. cruise, and calculate the off design results for our truth source conditions, i.e. takeoff. And we keep tweaking the design data until we match whatever we have for the actual data point at the test stand. That's going to be our strategy. Now, I totally acknowledge this might not be the best way to tackle this problem. And if you have any other ideas and suggestions, please drop me a line in the comments. I am definitely not an expert in PyCycle Open MDAO, and I know I don't know a lot, but this is at least one way of doing it. We have also another source of information for the engine, which is its type certificate data sheet. We can head over to the FAA and download the CF34 TCDS. Links will also be in the description. From this file, we're going to use the rotor speeds. They are an important parameter for the low and high pressure compressor and turbines. However, the design point is very seldom at 100% N1 and N2. Instead, we'll choose values around 86% for N1 and 90% for N2. For the, access, uh, for the accessories, at cruise, we also do not have 100% of electrical load. Something around 50 to 60% is more typical, so we go with 60%. From this TCDS, we also use the number of stages for the fan and compressor. So one for the fan, three for the low pressure, and nine for the high pressure stages. Actually, what we would need are the pressure ratios at the design point for each one, and information that which is definitely not available for the public domain. So all we have is the total pressure ratio from the IK of CO2 database, which was 27.3. So we need to estimate the PRs, the pressure ratios. We start with the fan and typical values here would be 1.5 to 1.8. We're going to stick with 1.685, which was already in our pi cycle file. After the fan, we have three plus nine stages, that's 12. And we find out the pressure ratio per stage we take the 27.3, which is the total pressure ratio for our compressor and stages, divided by 1.685, which is the pressure ratio we chose for the fan. And we're going to elevate that to 1 over 12. This is going to give us 1.261 per stage. Now, for the low pressure compressor, we know that we have three stages. So we're going to take 1.261 to the third power. That gives us 2.006 as a pressure ratio for the low pressure compressor. And similarly for the high pressure compressor, we take 1.261 to the ninth power, that's gonna give us 8.076. These are the numbers we're gonna use in Pi cycle. And finally, from the G fact sheet for the CF34, we can obtain the diameter, the fan diameter, which in this case is 53 inches. And that wraps it for the public domain data available to us. 
It is not a lot, but it's what we have. Well, now we can get all this information that we collected and see what happens when we feed it to PyCycle. In the next episode, we're going to see what the code looks like and start shaping it towards our own CF34. I'll see you there.